Anybody love Jesus here tonight? Yeah. All right. Anybody getting anything at least Wednesday night? So you, yeah. Obviously, you're here. I guess you're getting something or you're here. Okay. Or you're just still hoping to get something. Uh, well, this is your last chance for a while. So, you know, the last couple of weeks, uh, I've been sharing about the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the nine gifts of the Spirit. And uh, we've learned in the book of 1 Corinthians 12, there are, there are nine what we call manifestation gifts. And I'm just going to recap a little and then get into tonight's teaching. Um, and there, there are really three types of gifts listed in the Bible. There are uh, ministry gifts. Um, Ephesians 4.11 said, And Jesus gave gifts to men, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, but they're not the only ones. We find in, in other parts of the New Testament there are other gifts that, that are there. Those are what are considered like the, the, the governmental or the foundational gifts uh, for the church. But there are other gifts as well. It's gifts of administration, gifts of help, gifts, all kinds of different ones. So those are ministry gifts. That's something that, that's, and it's a gift. If I say gift, it's a gift that God gives us. Okay? So it's not something you earn. It's not like you go to school to, I mean, you can go to school for, to get a degree in pastoring, but that doesn't make you a pastor. Okay, I mean, so... Uh, a pastor is one of those, that's, that's an anointing from God. Now, you do you need to educate yourself and go to school? But the gift is there, and then you develop the gift. Now, then there's motivational gifts we find in Romans. And everybody has a motivational gift. Maybe sometime I'll teach on those because it's really fun. I love to teach on those. Um, and we have a motivational gift test I used to give out. And it's interesting. You go through that and you'll say, oh, that's why I'm the way I am. That's why my wife acts that way. That's why my husband, that's why he sees things differently than I do. Because no matter what our gifting, if you have a ministry gift, you'll flow out of your motivational gift. Uh, like one of the motivation, motivational gifts is mercy. And so if you have the motivational gift of mercy, you're always going around saying, bless your heart, bless your heart. Can I help you? Can you help you? But you'll never be able to confront anybody with an issue because you're just so full of mercy. You're going to take them food. You're going to do stuff for them. You're going to love on them. But if, there, if there's an issue, you, 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 you'll recoil from that because that's not your motivation. You, you won't want somebody shaking your head right now. You know what I'm talking about. See, it's not my gift, by the way. Um, now, I have mercy. I, I have compassion for people, but that's not my motivational gift. Not my strong motivational gift. So uh, though, those are interesting. They're so, but, but everybody has a motivational gift, I believe. The, the third is the manifestation gifts, and that's what we've talked about. And we found there were nine. I'm just going to recoup this and then bounce into tonight. There are nine gifts of the Spirit found in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. There are three gifts that say something, tongues, interpretation of tongues and prophecy. There are three gifts that reveal something, word of wisdom, word of knowledge, and discerning of spirits. Not the gift of discernment, but the discerning of spirits. And then three gifts that do something are what we call the power gifts and the gift of faith, the working of miracles, and the gifts, plural, of healings, plural. Uh, the multiple gifts of healings. Now, all of those work, those are gifts, those are not gifts that you have. Those are gifts the Holy Spirit has that he releases into your life at any given point in time uh, that, that, that he wants to use you or you want to be used to the Lord and, and, and God can work through you. And uh, as I said uh, last week and the week before, some, who, what's the best gift? It's the one you need right then. That's, that's the best gift. See, So that's a recap on that. But tonight what we want to do is I want to focus on who in this last Wednesday night together for a while, I want to focus on who the Holy Spirit is rather than what the Holy Spirit can do for us. And see, we're going to start with the introduction that Jesus gave the Holy Spirit and his disciples in the book of John. In John chapter 14, 15 through 17, Jesus says this, If you love me, obey my commandments. This is the New Living Translation. If you love me, obey my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate. Another translation is helper, who will never leave you. And then he, and then he introduces him. He says, he is the Holy Spirit, who leads into all truth. The world cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him. Now, what Jesus is saying here is lost people, lost people are not going to receive what I'm about to tell you because they, 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 don't, they don't know the Holy Spirit. And he says, but you know him because he lives with you now. I want you to notice that terminology. He lives with you now. We're on the same way. He lives with you now and later will be in you. 
Now, I want you to notice the difference there. Just pause for a minute. What's he saying? He, he lives with you now. That's salvation. He'll, later, he will be in you. That's the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's what Jesus is talking to him about. So he's with you now. He's with you. But he's going to be in you. Now, this is an introduction. And then in chapter 16, Jesus expounds more on Holy, who the Spirit is in verses 5 through 15. First of all, Jesus gives the promise of the Holy Spirit. Verse 5, but now I'm going away to the one who sent me and not one of you is asking me where I'm going. Instead, you grieve because of what I've told you. But in fact, it's best for you that I go away because if I don't, if I don't go away, the advocate or the helper won't come. If I do go away, then I will send him to you. Now, again, we see here Jesus is, is introducing the Holy Spirit as, as, an, as an individual, uh, the third person of the Godhead, God the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, that uh, we're going to swap positions, is what Jesus is saying. The Father's going to send him. With a, where, where is the Father? Where, where's God? We, we assume he's in heaven. Okay, he's in heaven, all right? That's not a trick question. So the Father's in heaven sitting on the throne room, the authority of God. And so if the Father's going to send him, where's the Holy Spirit? At that time, in heaven. And Jesus said, I'm going to go away and the Father will send him. They're going to change geographical positions. So Jesus said, I'm going to go away and the Father's going to send him. Now, then we see in John chapter 16, what, what we see is to begin with the purpose of the Holy Spirit. And when he, when he comes, he will convict the world of its sin, verses 8 through 15, and of God's righteousness and of the coming judgment. The world's sin, now I want you to notice verse 9. Here's a whole teaching. The world's sin is that it refuses to believe in me. Now, I've heard people say, I don't say it because individuals can take it out of context and use it to, to legitimize their behavior. I've heard people say, a preacher say before, uh, sin is not what is going to send people to hell that we preached about Sunday. Sin is not what sends people to hell. It's unbelief. Now, sin separates us from God. So that's why I don't make that statement out because people can tell you, well, all right, then I'm going to live any way I want to and I'm going to believe in Jesus. I believe in Jesus and I'm going to live like hell. No, that doesn't work, see. It doesn't go together. So Jesus said here, the world's sin is that it refuses to believe in me. Hmm. That's a sin. Righteousness is available because I go to the Father and you will see me no more. Judgment will come because the ruler of this world has already been judged. Now, what's, who's the ruler of this world? Right now, it's Satan. Right now, it's Satan. There is so much more I want to tell you, but you can't bear it. Now, all of this is the purpose of the Holy Spirit. There's so much more I want to tell you, but you can't bear it. Now, when the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak of his own, but will tell you what he has heard. He will tell you about the future. He will bring me glory by telling you whatever he receives from me. And all that belongs to the Father is mine. And this is why I said the Spirit will tell you whatever he receives from me. So we see, the, we see here the promise of the Holy Spirit, and then Jesus gives them the purpose of the Holy Spirit. And yes, we could spend a few hours dissecting all of those scriptures of what they're saying and what they're talking about and what they're dealing with. But you, you, you see there's a, there's a very clear definitive job description for an individual, the Holy Spirit. Okay. Now, the reason I'm bringing this out is because last week we talked, last two weeks about the gifts of the Spirit. I don't want us to be so enamored that we're focused on pursuing the gifts of the Spirit because in, in reality, we need to pursue the Holy Spirit, not the gifts. Now, I talked to you last week. I talked about how to pursue and how to covet spiritual gifts, how to pray for that, how to, how to walk in faith. I gave you three points on that. But that, that's secondary to what I'm talking about tonight is a pursuit of a relationship with the Holy Spirit. Then we go to Acts chapter 1, verses 4 through 8. And the first thing we see is a command from Jesus. In verse 4, Jesus said, Once when he was eating with them, he commanded them, do not leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift he promised, as I told you before. And then, and then and Luke here is quoting Jesus. John baptized with water, but in just a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. That's just very plain. I don't know why we can't understand that. 
I don't understand why there's theological challenges to that. It's just so simple. The words of Jesus. You've been baptized. John baptized with water. I'm going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Then we see the concept of the disciples, what they, the conceptualization of what Jesus was saying, and they were wrong. Verse 6, so when the apostles were with Jesus, they kept asking him, Lord, has the time come for you to free Israel and restore our kingdom? Now, their concept of Jesus preaching about the kingdom of God was that he was going to overthrow Caesar and the Roman Empire and establish Christianity, and they're all going to be rulers all over the world, the known world at that time, because Rome was the most powerful government and force in the world, that part of the world anyway, at that day and time. And that was their concept, is that Jesus was going to overthrow. You remember, James and John's mother came to, to Jesus one time and said, when you come into your kingdom, in other words, when you're Caesar, when, when you're king and you depose Caesar, can my sons, James and John, sit on your right hand and on your left at your throne? He says, you don't know what you're asking. You, 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 don't, you, don't, you don't understand. Your concept is so wrong. Now, their concept, that Jesus is telling them, and he's saying here, I want you to go to Jerusalem and wait, and the promise of the Father is going to come. You're going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And he says, well, now, now when, are you going to, when are you going to overthrow Caesar? When are, that, that's what they're saying. When, when are you going to establish your kingdom? Now, here's what Jesus said. Verse 7, this is correction from Jesus. He says this, the Father alone has authority to set those dates and times and they are not for you to know. But, now the, the chapters and verses were added later to the original writings. So this is, a, this is a complete thought flowing through here. But let me just pause just a moment and throw out something. I've seen Christians over the last few years get so enamored with politics that it has displaced really their faith and confidence in God and, and their confidence in somebody, a person or, or whatever, or pro, that, that, you know, if, if this person is not elected or this person's not in, and uh, then, then, well, oh, it's just all going to fly. Or just, you know, we can't do anything for God. Everything's just going to be awful. Well, I'd be the first one to tell you I'm in, not in agreement with anything that's happening in Washington, D.C., okay? I'll just be honest with you, okay? Um, I think we could just change it all, change all of them. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not in agreement with the leadership in the White House right now, not in agreement with their morals, not in agreement with their ethics of anything they're doing, okay? But here's the thing about it. Jesus was born under the Roman Empire. Jesus was crucified under the Roman, which was the most heathenistic uh, sexually perverted, um, if you want to study the Roman Empire, sexually perverted, I'm talking about Caesar and, and, and all the, I'm talking about from the top down and in Rome, um, the, the debauchery that was there. And that's when Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. And there wasn't anybody in office that was a Christian, okay? So I think we have to understand, I'm just throwing this as a sidebar, as Jesus correcting them, their focus was on let's overthrow Caesar and then we can do our thing. He said, I, I, want you to, I want you to understand something. That's not what you need to be focusing on. What you need to focus on, that's, that's on the Father's timing and it's none of your business right now. What you need to do is you will receive power, verse 8, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. There it is. Now, let me back up in case somebody misunderstood me. I'm not saying we shouldn't be politically active. We should be. We should vote. We should, we should stand up. We should do all of those things. What I'm trying to say is there's a balance there because I've seen some Christians get so involved and so upset and so ingrained in them that they, they're no good in the kingdom. They've, they've, lost, they've lost their perspective and they've got out of, out of balance. I've got a good friend that just got totally out of balance in that area and was good for nothing. I mean, really, in, in ministry or anything else because they're so just, in, just in, caught up in, in everything that's going on. There's a balance in everything of life. God is a God of balance. If he wasn't, we'd be floating in the air right now. We have gravity that keeps us where we are right now. 
God's a God of balance. These worlds are spinning, the earth and our galaxy and all of that stuff. It's all perfectly balanced. And no big boom called it, caused it to happen. A big creator caused it to happen. See? And so we just need to keep our minds on that and, and understand, yes, we can be actively, and some are really called in that area. But don't get out of balance in our relationship with God, expecting, I heard somebody say, God needs America. No, America needs God. See, America needs God. God needs. Okay, back on to this teaching. Acts 1.8 is a powerful verse that I just read to you. He says, boys, here's what you do. You're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you'll be witnesses telling people about me everywhere, Judea, Jerusalem, Samaria, the ends of the earth. Okay. So that's, that's what Jesus, that's Jesus' introduction to the Holy Spirit with his disciples. Now, he ascends into heaven. They go, of course, to Jerusalem and to what we know as the upper room. They pray several days, and the Holy Spirit was given. We know that. Now, I want to go from there to 2 Corinthians 13, 14, uh, of, of a scripture, a verse that Paul is basically a salutation to the church. The New King James Version reads it this way, The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ... And the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. The New Living Translation says, May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Now, the word communion or fellowship there means communicating with or traveling together with or transporting together. Same thing. It, it, it means like you're, you're doing things together. You're traveling together. That, that's the inference there, communion, the communion of the Holy Spirit. Now, it can be said that you can measure civilization by the development of its transportation system. That's one of the things that Rome did that set them apart. They developed road systems that some of those roads are still there today. And every 20 miles, they develop like an outpost like where you could get groceries, so to speak. You could get supplies of some kind. Uh, you could have a, a place to stay, like an inn or something, every 20 miles. And that because that was, that was the normal, at walking speed, day's journey. When the Bible says they went a day's journey, it's speaking about 20 miles. And so if they're walking, they would walk 20 miles in a day. And every 20 miles, they, they had a station like that. They had a magnificent, they had an incredible road system. And also their, their army could move through that, you know, rapidly as well. Now, what happened, though, in 2020 when governments shut down international travel and put restrictions on travel within their own country? You know, up until recently, You've seen maybe the things on the news where they wouldn't even let people, they locked some people in their apartments in China. And one of them caught on fire and many people died because their doors were locked. They couldn't get out because the Communist Party locked them in there. So you, you see what travel was shut down. International travel was shut down. I was just in Alaska a couple of weeks ago preaching and I, on the spot where I preached, I preached on that same spot in 2011, the original 2011. I was doing a three-day meeting there then. And on that night that the, the trade centers were, were, were blown up, I preached that night. It was standing room only. There's people standing around the, around the walls that night. Uh, but I couldn't get home for several days because uh, they shut the airlines down. They, and everybody was scared out of their mind. And uh, no flights. They wouldn't let any flights go. And, and I had to stay several more days up there. I stayed with a missionary He'd take me to the airport every day and drop me off, and I'd call him about 1 a.m. in the morning and say, I didn't get on a plane. He'd come get me because uh, they put me on standby when, once they started flying again. Uh, businesses were interrupted in 2020. Uh, many of them failed. Uh, large gatherings of people were not allowed. People lost their jobs. Uh, shipping and transportation of products came to a halt. I mean, we still can't get some stuff and supplies and things. Um, many items became in short supply. Uh, in 2020, we had a trip planned with people in our church to go to Israel, and we had to cancel that trip. 
Uh, I had a vacation plan. Had to cancel that vacation because I was flying there. Couldn't do it. In 21, I already had this schedule. I was supposed to, in February, fly to Amsterdam and do a conference in Amsterdam. And uh, it was aired, supposed to be aired all over uh, the Arabic nations, especially in Iran and, and, and Iraq. And uh, I did it, but I did it from my office at home with this this iPad right here on a Zoom and I preached to a group of people in Amsterdam and then it was all, and then from there it was, it was through TV was all over Iran and my interpreter was in London, England. So he's here on one side and I'm here on the other side and then bottom of the screen you see these people at this conference and of course they had them sitting six feet apart with masks on. But I was supposed, Rose and I were supposed to go from Amsterdam to Crimea the Crimea Peninsula, and uh, preach at a youth camp down there. I've done it before. They want me to come back and do a youth camp. Then from there, we were going to back to Moscow and preaching in Moscow in a church I helped plant there. All of that later on South Africa, all of that was just wiped away. Could, couldn't go anywhere because everything was shut down. So it disrupted so much. And also reports have been given that the COVID-19 pandemic contributed and increased trends of suicide attempts, domestic conflicts, of violence, of financial loss, anxiety, depression. Why? Because we couldn't travel. You say, well, what does that have to do with communion of the Holy Spirit? Well, because the same is true spiritually. What's the definition of communion? Traveling together. You know, going on a journey together. The communion of the Holy Spirit is essentially for our spiritual well-being. From Dr. Yonggi Cho's book, uh, The Holy Spirit, My Senior Partner, here's a quote from that. He says, the measure of our faith is in direct proportion to our communion with the Holy Spirit. Through the communion of the Holy Spirit, we receive spiritual blessings and we tell him our earnest desires. You know, Romans 10, 17 says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So faith comes by the word of God. And I've always said your faith level will be determined by your word level. But that's really half of it. Your faith level is because the letter killeth, but the spirit giveth life. And so half of that is your word level. You've got to have the word on the inside of you. You've got to, you've got to, you've got to know what the word of God says. You want to overcome fear? You've got to know what the word of God says about fear. See? If you want to overcome sickness, you've got to, what, what does the word have to say about that? Get, get a scripture and start meditate on it. But then the other part of that is the Holy Spirit giving revelation to that and making it real to us and, and speaking to us and giving us direction or giving us an idea or giving us a guide or something to do. The Holy Spirit giving us a thought to do something. Uh, I was on the phone with the pastor that I'm an overseer uh, of, served as an overseer of his church for many, many years, a dear friend. And uh, I said, uh, uh, how's, how's your process on your building program going? Because he's thinking about, last time I talked to him, he said, we're, we're talking about, you know, building a building. $18 million project is what they're looking at. And uh, I said, what, wh where are you on that? Just give me an update because I'm an overseer of the church. He says, well, I really felt like the Holy Spirit spoke to me just to take care of what I've got and he would open up the doors that I needed. $18 million program, listen to the Holy Spirit. Yeah, I think that's better. I said, well, I believe that's the word of the Lord. It's so God, God will make a way. God, God, will, God will show you what to do. They're packed out two services, so they're going to have to go to three services. I'm going to be with him in a few weeks down there. And uh, they're just outside of Houston, Texas, and just, just growing. He says, but I, I felt like the Holy Spirit said that to me. Well, then that's what we need to follow, see. That, that's communion. That's, that's doing the journey with the Holy Spirit. Uh, you've probably heard me use the quote before from the pulpit. It's my favorite Reinhard Bonnke quote. Now, if you don't know who Reinhard Bonnke is, you can Google that. Um, he's a, a, a German evangelist and, and best known in Africa. Um, just has won millions of people to the Lord and moved in great power and authority. But my favorite quote from Reinhard is, God goes with goers, but he doesn't sit with sitters. Did you get that? He goes with goers, but he doesn't sit with sin. In other words, if we just said, said we're not going to do anything, he's like, well, do it by yourself. You're going to do nothing by yourself. I'm not going to do nothing with you. And if you want to do something, I'll do that. And I've learned that, that, that in, in life, every time I've taken a step of faith, every time I believe the Lord dropped something in my heart to do, then I, I just I step out and do it. I don't have all the answers, but I, but I have a word on the inside. The first building program that I went into, 
um, in, in our first church in Kentucky. Uh, we, no, nobody would loan us any money. We were a new church. Uh, we were all, the, the found, founding couples were all in their 20s. And uh, none of us had any money. We had jobs. We didn't have any money. And uh, uh, so we, we, we couldn't do anything. And so I, I got plans up, and I had a little bit of building experience. And I got to an architect and draw some plans up, and, and it was a miracle that uh, we, get, we got a piece of property. Uh, in fact, I'll just tell you, is that okay if I tell you this? All right, so there was eight and a half acres right on the outskirts of town. It is right in the edge of the city limits. It's the first piece of property as you come in on the state highway into the town. And several people had tried to buy it, but they couldn't because there were 60, 64 heirs in the property. So there were 64 people on the title, the deed. And uh, I was praying, I drove by there and I felt like the Lord wanted us, that that's our property. And so I'm just young enough and dumb enough to go for it. Uh, the richest man in the county tried to buy it. He owned the only car dealership in town. And uh, he owned the property across from it. His son had a big mansion over there, right across from the church, where, where the church wound up being. And uh, he, he couldn't get it done. And the Lord just, I just had an idea uh, to go talk to this, this, uh, this attorney. And he went to the General Baptist Church there in town. And his name was Tommy. And I went to Tommy. I said, uh, uh, this is, uh, we want to buy that property. He said, well, now, now Reverend, you know that, uh, that uh, nobody's been able. I said, I know. But I, I said, I really feel like the Lord want me to come to you. He said, well, I do have an idea. I said, what's that? He said, let's send out letters to all of them and, uh, and make an offer on the property and see how many sign it. He said, if we can get enough of them to sign it, that's a majority, then we can force a sale over the rest of it on the courthouse steps. Sounds good to me. I don't know what you're talking about, but it sounds good to me. And so he did, and we offered $25,000 for eight and a half acres on the state highway. <laughs> $25,000. Now, that was in 1986, but still, it was prime property. I mean, you could have developed and put houses on it and made more money than that. And I know the richest man in the county would have paid four or five times that for it. So that's what we did. Guess what? 62 of the 64 signed it. So I essentially owned it, the church, owned it all but whatever two sixty-fourths is. And so then those wanted their money, so they forced a sale at the courthouse. And I went to the courthouse steps there, and, and I bid on it, and, and I bought it. Well, there's nobody else. I mean, there's four or five people. But nobody's, they knew what was going on by then. There was a buzz in the community, and we're not bidding against that preacher. And, uh, and, and quite frankly, somebody had offered $100,000 for it, and, and I didn't bid on it. We, owe, we owned 62 of 64, whatever percentage that is. That's 97 percent of the property. Anyway, we would have got the money, see. But God, that was just a thought for me to go talk to that. See, that's the Holy Spirit. And then, and then later on, we're going to build. Now we've got to build a building. By the way, we didn't have $25,000 either. And the Lord, the Lord provided it. When we had to have it. And then we went to build a building. And I was struggling with, oh, Lord Jesus, I don't know if I, I, don't know if I need to build a building. I don't know if I can build a building. And I was in bed one night. I still see myself propped up in bed, rose next to me there. And, and I, was, I was reading from Nehemiah, and it said, Arise and build, for the Lord is with you. And the Holy Spirit just, I've read that a bunch of times, but when I read it that time, it was like the Holy Spirit lit that on fire on the inside of me. And I knew he was speaking to me. And so I went around, I went to the guy that knew me the best in the county. In fact, I was renting a house from him. He was the president of the bank, biggest bank in the county. Wouldn't, wouldn't give me a dime. So I went to a banker I didn't even know, never met there in the town where our church was and met with him. And guess what? He loaned me the money. And we came in in budget and a beautiful church. The building there now, it's the largest church building in the county, largest one in the county. And it's right on that main road coming in. Well, it's better when you're traveling with the Holy Spirit. You know, if you're, if you're, 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 if you're single here and you're dating somebody, get the approval of the Holy Spirit on that. Well, no, they're cute. But they could be mean too. 
I mean, cute's not everything. Okay. Well, he's got a lot of money. Yeah. And as a reason, he's single. Okay. Well, you know, she just, oh, I believe I can fix her. <laughs> you don't even need to pray about that. That's just dumb. That's just dumb. That's just dumb. Okay. Okay. You ain't fix anybody. Okay. Don't, don't buy a fixer upper. Okay. Don't, don't do that. No, 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 no. Uh, so I'm just talking about walking with the Holy Spirit. You want to start a business. Okay. The Holy Spirit, if, if that's the direction the Lord has for you, the, the Holy Spirit will help you, but don't get ahead of the Holy Spirit. Walk together. He's our helper, our advocate. The Greek word is paraclete, one called alongside to help. That's what it means. And, and so doing life, when I'm talking about, I'm talking about not pursuing the Holy Spirit just because he's got gifts and can do stuff and make you feel good. No, no. No, the Holy Spirit is to be our partner in life, our spiritual partner in life, walking through life together. Well, what about Jesus? Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father, interceding for you. That's what the Bible says. He ever lives to intercede for you. It's a terminology thing, but the Holy, he said, I'm, I'm going to the Father and the Holy Spirit's coming here. He's going to be in you. He's going to lead you. He's going to teach you. He's going to help you. He's going to reveal things to you. He's going to give you things. Now, the word communion is translated from the Greek word, and it has two important meanings. And I'm going to hit this, and we'll be done tonight. Are you getting anything? It has two important meanings, the word communion. Now, too often, we are in user mode with the Holy Spirit rather than relationship mode. And by that, I mean the Holy Spirit is a tool. I need the power of the Holy Ghost. And we want the, we want a gift. Of, I need the gift of healing right now. I need the gift of faith right now. Okay, and, and it's like, okay, it's like we have a project here. So we go to our spiritual tool chest and we pull out the Holy Spirit and we, and we get it done and we put the Holy Spirit back in the toolbox. It doesn't work that way. We're, we don't need to be in user mode, but in relationship mode with the Holy Spirit. Does that make any sense with anybody? So there are two very important things uh, uh, translated from this Greek word communion. One is fellowship on the basis of intimate friendship. And when I say intimate, the most intimate, the inference of this original word, I mean, it's, it's it, as intimate as it gets. Because without fellowship with the Holy Spirit, there can be no spiritual life, no faith, no power, no victory. See, the early church prayed fervently, was passionate, full of vitality and thanksgiving, like a fresh water spring springing up. And when a church is completely driven by programs to the point that it excludes the Holy Spirit, it becomes simply a memorial of God instead of a living institution for the power of God. Now, there's nothing wrong with having programs as long as programs don't have you. I just got off the phone. Two pastors that I've consulted with in two different states this week, and I've, I've told them the same thing because they're growing. Uh, they're, they're, the numbers are growing, but they're struggling. They're having growing pains, okay? You don't see what happens behind the scenes here to accommodate growth. You, you, don't, you, have, you, you don't see what happens. And so uh, both of these, one I just talked to this afternoon sitting in the hospitality room. I said, here, here's the two things you have to keep in mind, okay? What drives the growth is that you've got powerful ministry. You've got the power of the Holy Ghost. You have a gathering anointing on your life, and people are coming. Okay. Now, that, that, that's what brings the harvest in. I said, you're a combine. I grew up on the farm, and so I used farming things. You're a combine. Now, what you need is a grain bin. Because if you just keep combine and you turn the auger on, it's just going to pour it out on the field. And you, you'll, you'll keep having good services, but you'll hit a plateau of numbers and you'll never go above that plateau of numbers, but you'll keep having good services and you'll feel good and you'll think you're in a revival, but you're just, you're just exchanging the grain, see. And I said, so the grain bin is two things. Number, are y'all with me here? So, and as I'm talking about the Holy Spirit, the grain bin is two things. Number one, there's two things that, that builds a grain bin. One is systems. That's what you do. That, that's what you do. It's how you do stuff and what you do. And then there's management. That's who does it. And so you have to have systems in place to get the grain from the field to, to the bin, so to speak, 
discipled, trained, empowered, released in ministry. That's what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about putting in a holding place. I'm just using that as an analogy. But how do you get people discipled? How do you get people in deeper in the things of God and know the things of God? Release them, finding their gifts, their abilities. Release them in ministry. Get them productive in ministry. Get them healed. Get, get them encouraged. Get them to a place where they can help people be healed. See, that's your systems. You have to have that in place. It's called discipleship. Now, but if systems and programs is all you have, then it's an empty tomb. I mean, there might be a lot of people roaming around doing stuff, but there's no life, and eventually it will die, see, because there's no life there. Programs or systems, I call them, are important to the point to where they're all submitted to the Holy Spirit on what we need to do, see. And we constantly here at Discover Life Church are constantly reviewing those things to make sure we're in sync with what we believe the Holy Spirit wants us to do and how he wants us to do it. And we're totally receptive to adjustments at any time. Now, you've got to, as individuals, we have to be that way in our lives. If you're running a business, yeah, it's okay if if that's if that's what God has called you to do, then the Holy Spirit is there to help you with that business, and to help you with those employees, and to help you with the management. Yeah, you need to learn things. We we're all constantly doing that, learning new things. What's God doing now? Developing. But but to do that, if if your marriage is 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 struggling, and who's doesn't from time to time, if you if you have an issues or something. All right, where does the Holy Spirit come in here? You know, where, 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 does, where does that come in? Well, if you're both traveling with the person of the Holy Spirit, you're engaged relationally with the Holy Spirit rather than as a user, as a tool in your toolbox, your spiritual toolbox, the Holy Spirit can help you, can speak to you. You know, there have been times I've prayed, oh, Lord, don't tell her I said this now, okay? I said, oh, Lord... I wish you'd help Rose. I'm telling you, she needs help. And the Holy Spirit would convict me. You need help, boy. Well, I see, if I wasn't receptive to that, I might not even be here talking to you today. See? But, but it's, see, that's with your traveling with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit can drop things in your heart. Um, and, and just and just help you to see something, give give you a wisdom, a word of wisdom about something. See, so just guidance. But it's as we pursue relationship and fellowship with the Holy Spirit. Okay, let me go to the next one. The second meaning of communion in the original Greek of the word communion is to do business in partnership. This simply means that we work together as partners for the same purpose, to share the joy, share sorrow, share victory, share challenges. And all of our efforts must be in partnership with the Holy Spirit to accomplish maximum results. You say, well, that's fine and good, Pastor. Then how do you do that? Well, I'll just tell you what I do, and I'm still learning, okay? Uh, I, I, when I start my mornings, it's a good morning, Holy Spirit. And I'm not, I don't say that because somebody wrote a book with that title. I say, good morning, Holy Spirit. A lot of times I'll say, Father, thank you for creating this wonderful world. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross for me, that through, through you I can be saved. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. And thank you, Holy Spirit, for being with me right here, right now, and helping me today. And I, want, I want to travel with you today, Holy Spirit. I want every, Everything I do, every place I go, I want to be sensitive to your voice and, and what I need to do in life. Now, if I ran a business, it wouldn't be any different. If I drove a truck for a living, if I ran a backhoe for a living, if I was a plumber, it didn't, didn't, I would do the same thing. Holy, Holy Spirit, help me. Help me today to bring honor and glory to the Father. Show me what, what I, I, need, I need to know today. Protect me today. Guard me. Keep me from, from harm today, from deception of other people, Holy Spirit. So what are you doing? You're not, you're not taking the Holy Spirit out of your, out of your tool case and using him for something, you're saying, we're doing this together. Does that make sense to anybody? See, we're doing this together. Um, 
Dad, you want to be better dads? Holy Spirit, help me. Help me to have patience with my children. Help, help me to have wisdom with my children. Holy Spirit, help me. And then you pray, you pray for your children that way. You pray for your family that way. I pray over Rosary. God bless her. Bless my wife, Lord. Thank you for my wife. Bless her, Lord. Guide her this day. May she experience joy today. May, see, I, I'm engaging in relationship with the Holy Spirit. I'm not just using the Holy Spirit as a tool when I need something. Many times prayer is nothing more than a spiritual fire extinguisher for some people. The only time they pray is they, they got, you know, the house is on fire, spiritually speaking or otherwise, and they break the glass and they get the, they get the fire extinguisher out, whatever. No, it's a daily walk. It's a daily walk with him. It's a daily walk with him. Are you, are you getting anything tonight? Just making any sense. So yes, we want the gifts of the Spirit, the manifestation gifts, the motivation gifts, the ministry gifts. We want those things. But really, it hinges on that intimate relationship with the Lord. And I'm going to tell you, that's not reserved for preachers. It isn't. You know, that was one of the biggest hindrances I had uh, as a young man of going into the ministry. Because it seemed to me like, now maybe it's just my fault, but it seemed to me like that many of the preachers so mystified the Holy Spirit and the things of God. And I, I don't know, I could have been wrong. But to the point to where you, you just had to be some special person for God to speak to and God to use and, and every time that would well up in me, like God was drawing me in the ministry, I'd say, God, I can't, I can't do that. Who do I think I am? I can't get a sermon and preach. And now I can't read the Bible without seeing 10 sermons. I mean, I can't, I can't, that's the easiest thing in the world. Why? Because I'm walking with the Holy Spirit. I mean, I open the word of up, and there's a revelation, and there's a sermon, there's a sermon. There. Wow, there's a message, there's a truth. When I say sermon, there's a truth, there's a life lesson, there's something. Well, but you can do that too. Listen, if God can do that for me, he can do that for you. You know, one of the first staff people I hired here many, many years ago, as pastoring a small church, and he came, he said, I just want to be an assistant. He said, I just can't get sermons together. He said, it's the hardest thing in the world for me. I just can't, I can't, I just can't come up with sermons. That's okay. You won't have to preach much here. When he left here, he took a church and he preached three times every week. It's easy for him to get sermons because he learned while he was here, see. Now, you, you, God wants to work through you. God wants to speak to you. Uh, but as you just pursue, you just make it a point that every day you just start your day that way. And, and if, you're, if, you're, if you're trying to make a decision on something, say, Holy Spirit, what do you think I should do? Now, I don't know that God really cares that much about what tie you're buying or if you're getting a blue blouse or a red blouse. I, you know, I mean, if you want to pray over those things, fine. I don't, I mean, I don't do, I don't say, Holy Spirit, where should I get gas today? Maybe I should, but I don't. I just pull off the place I usually get gas, okay, you know. Where should I buy milk today? Okay, no, I'm going to the cheapest place that's got milk. I don't have to pray about that, see. But what I'm saying is you're going through life, you're just consciously aware of the presence of the Lord through the Holy Spirit. You, you just develop a conscious awareness of that. I'm going to tell you what that else will do. It'll, it'll keep you out of sin. It'll, it'll help you. Because you've got a conscious awareness, the Holy Spirit's there with you. And a temptation comes up and it's like, warning, warning, danger, danger. <laughs> no, 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 no. Hell's coming. Hell is coming. No, okay, no, I'm not. I'm not. I mean, you, you, I don't know about you, but it works that way with me, okay? Because the Holy Spirit's going like, eh, 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 eh. you know, that warning, warning sign's going off. It says, okay, yes, sir, I'm going to get away from that. And you know what? Sometimes, you know, the devil is very subtle. The devil is very subtle. And there's sometimes you can be deceived. And there have been times when I, I was being deceived. And, uh, and uh, down on the inside, the Holy Spirit's like, you need to back off from that. Just, just back away from that. I'm like, well, I don't see nothing wrong. Back off from that. Yeah. 
I'm thankful for that. I don't know about you all, but I'm thankful for that. You see, that all comes out of relationship with and communion with the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit, if, if, if we have to transition our mindset and our thinking from I want the Holy Ghost to fall and I want to fall and I want the glory cloud to come in. There's nothing wrong with that whatsoever. I want God to use me with the gifts of the Spirit. Nothing wrong with that. The Bible says covet spiritual gifts. But that should not be our focus. That should be a byproduct of our communion with the Holy Spirit. See? A byproduct. On the day of Pentecost, if you look at that, it was wind and fire. But not always. Elijah was in the cave. An earthquake came. The fan came. The fire came. And then there was a still, small voice. And that was God speaking to him. So the key is not to pursue the other stuff first, but to pursue the relationship and the communion with the Holy Spirit. And I don't have to have a miracle to happen every day to love Jesus. Okay? In fact, I don't ever have to have anything else in the world happen to me for me to love Jesus. But the point is that I don't have to, have to have, go from one high to another high because it's not about the highs. It's about the relationship with Jesus. It's his presence. It's his presence that makes a difference. Well, I'm going to close with this. Our time is up. You know, Sunday morning I got up uh, in both the services. Before I preach, I said I want to pray for some people. The Holy Spirit told me to pray for people that need hearing. I, I, I don't know how many testimonies have come in for that. One elderly lady, her ear opened up completely. A guy came to me this week here at the church said, I just got to tell you this. He's had some kind of incurable something in his, in his hearing where he's ringing all the time. And he said, the doctor says incurable. He said, when you prayed that prayer, it quit. And, and it's, it's quit. He said, I hadn't had since then. I just, I, just come, I just had to come tell you. I said, well, thank you, Jesus. Well, it wasn't me. I mean, other than I was just being obedient to the Lord. But, but I'm saying that because God can work through you that way. Because all I'm doing is being sensitive to and obedient to the Holy Spirit. See, that's all. Don't, don't, don't. I, I, I want to demystify it as much as possible, because see, it's easy. It's easy for let me say it's easy for preachers to get up and say, "I'm special. I got a revelation from God that you don't have. God is using me, and you want to be around me." <laughs> I don't buy into that nonsense. Okay, that's theatrics, okay, and it's self. That's what I'm looking for: promotion. I, I, I believe if God don't promote me, I, I, don't, I don't need to be promoted, okay? I, I don't need it. I don't need it. I had a pastor call me this afternoon and said, I heard you had 45 people saved in Alaska in your services the other weekend. I said, yeah, that's right. He said, I want you to, would you come to my church and let's pray for 45 people saved in our church? I said, yeah, let's pray about it, okay? I said, but you need to understand he said, in fact, in fact, if you, you come to my church, I've heard there's some people from Alaska. I already talked to them. They want to fly down from Alaska and be here when I can come to my church. Okay, that's fine. That's all good. But here's the thing about it. We're all just instruments of the Lord, okay? We're just all breathing, eating stuff, you know, instruments of the Lord, okay? You sleep in one bed of a night, drive one car at a time, okay? Wear one pair of shoes at a time. If we can stay humble, Keep ourselves humble before the Lord. See, that's the key. In communion with the Holy Spirit, God can use you. He could use you to pray for somebody at your work and they get miraculously healed right there. He, he could use you to have a word of knowledge about somebody and transform their life, see? He can use you, but it, it's, it's not because we want to look like somebody. It's because we're walking in communion with the Holy Spirit.